Good morning, and welcome to today's celebration of the life and legacy of the Honorable Hubert H. Humphrey. One hundred years ago today, a great man was born, a man who would forever change the political and social landscape for Minnesota and our country. My name is Kathy Thunheim. I'm a principal of the Thunheim Public Relations Firm. Uh, an honor to have an opportunity to help uh, pull today together. I was one of the co-chairs of the Humphrey Centennial Celebration. My own personal Humphrey connection is that I was back in the 70s, worked for Governor Wendell Anderson, and on weekends would go do advance work on political campaigns, including the campaign, the last Senate campaign of Hubert Humphrey. And on one of those trips out in Fairfax, Minnesota, Humphrey introduced me to a guy named John Thunheim, who uh, a few years later became my husband. And so uh, just before our wedding, Vice President Humphrey called me and uh, took credit for the combination. And I will be forever grateful for so many things he did, including that. Bill Moyers, in the documentary Art of the Possible, captures the essence of Vice President Humphrey's legacy. He said, Hubert Humphrey was a great poet of American politics, but he was also a great plumber for American politics. He knew how to take the lofty rhetoric and the high ideals, the ambitions and aspirations of different people, and make them work, to put them in the pipeline of politics so that something practical came from them. That in terms of his political genius is the heart of it, I think. His ability to move us to think more grandly and generously about ourselves, even as he helped make the machinery more effective in carrying out our aspirations. What a great legacy, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to honor it today. To start off our program, please welcome Barbara Johnson, president of the Minneapolis City Council. Barbara was first elected to the Minneapolis City Council in 1997, has served as president since 2006. She also serves on the Board of Estimate and Taxation, the Board of Meet Minneapolis, the Riverfront Development Corporation, and Hennepin County's Task Force on Teen Pregnancy. President Johnson. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy. And I really want to offer a sincere and warm welcome to the Minneapolis Municipal Building. Uh, we are so delighted uh, to um, have you here today, friends of Hubert Humphrey. You know, it's really appropriate and fitting that this uh, Hubert Humphrey birthday centennial reunion and policy discussion is taking place in the Minneapolis City Hall and Courthouse. As you may know, Humphrey served as Mayor of Minneapolis from 1945 to 1948. Behind me are three stained glass windows. In the large center window there are three women. These women symbolize the virtues that we elected officials strive to secure for our citizenry. Humphrey's work was the epitome of these virtues as well. The woman on the left is holding a torch and an olive branch and she represents peace. The woman in the center is holding a law book and sword and she represents justice. The woman on the right is holding a beehive and she represents the ordered community where its members work collectively for the betterment of all. Hubert Humphrey exemplified these virtues throughout his political career. During his time as, in, as Minneapolis Mayor, United States Senator, and Vice President, he championed civil rights and the end of anti-Semitism. Vice President Humphrey also stood for the value of public service. I have been, this week, uh, trying to help my constituents through uh, natural disaster which happened in our community. And as I watch what is going on in our city, I'm struck by the essential and invaluable service provided by government. From police officers and firefighters who searched each house for victims, to the public works and forestry employees that are clearing our streets, Vice President Humphrey knew that we needed their help and the order that government provides to our nation. I am so happy that this celebration honoring him is happening in this building where his public career began. 
as long as people are telling uh, little stories, I just want to um, talk about uh, my mother, who uh, I followed into public service. Her name was Alice Rainville. She served as the first woman president of the Minneapolis City Council. And I remember as a very young woman, her, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Of course, she was a huge admirer and friend of Hubert Humphrey. And I remember her coming home and you know, in our home, politics was in the orange juice at the breakfast table, and her talking about how she was a skeptic about Medicare until she went to a public forum at which Senator Humphrey spoke about the necessary uh, protection that this provided for our citizens at, in their older years. And he convinced her. And that was his power, those remarkable uh, qualities which allowed him to persuade people about the life-changing value of government and how it can help people personally. So again, we are, look forward to a great day of celebrating his life and legacy and people reflecting on his work. And again, so delighted to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. In your program, you note that we were to be joined by Representative Betty McCollum, and unfortunately, she sent word yesterday that she needed to stay in Washington for a vote, um, sends her greetings, and I know we all uh, appreciate the continued service of uh, Representative McCollum. Hubert H. Humphrey III, son of Vice President Humphrey. Skip, as we all know, lives out his father's legacy every day as a civic leader, an advocate for vulnerable populations, including seniors and our children. We're honored to have Skip with us today to help celebrate his father's legacy. Please join me in welcoming my very good friend, Skip Humphrey. Well, thank you, Kathy. And uh, I just want you to know, Kathy, Jack married up. <laughs> Happy birthday, Dad. In spirit, you are here. You know, I told the story last night about coming into this building and remembering it as kind of a dark, black-sided building. And look at it today. To the members of the council and to the mayor, what a wonderful, wonderful place you have created for us as a people, as citizens of this city and of this state to admire and to be involved with and participate in. It's just wonderful. Now I know today we're going to hear a lot about some of the past and some of the, we're going to review history. But I hope that's not what today is all about. Today is really about tomorrow. Where are we going to go? Where is the progressive, practical, problem-solving politics that my father represented going to be tomorrow? I personally think that our state, our city, our country, and our world needs that kind of politics. These days you talk about politics and you get that sense of, oh, I don't want to get close to that. Politics is good. It's good business for democracy. It's the kind of thing we need to engage in. In fact, we have a responsibility to engage in. If I learned one thing from my father is there's no separation between a private life and a public life. You're a citizen in this country. You're a resident of this state. You have a responsibility to be involved and engaged. So I hope that's what we're all about. Now, I, got, I don't know whether you've had a chance to see all these cartoons, but there was a whole lot more of them. Political cartoons, what a way to show a life. My goodness gracious. I can think of a few other people that would have uh, rather interesting cartoon biographies. But what a wonderful way to see 
some of the things that my father was involved with uh, and the caricatures and how he was engaged in the daily life. So I hope today we will have a chance to explore some of those issues and some of those concerns. But I also hope we will always remember that what dad was most about was people. He never got far away from individuals. I had a chance, a wonderful chance, one of the few times where I traveled with my father alone. I'll never forget, we're in Rome, Italy. We're walking down the street and someone comes across this busy street yelling, Hubert, Hubert! Was someone from Minnesota that knew, you know, it was just like, well, we were home and we had to talk about those kinds of things and get things done. That's the kind of politics we need to constantly demand of ourselves and of our representatives for today and tomorrow. And I think it's more important today than ever before. We'll get into it in the details of the conversations. But you think about, we are so connected today, technologically. And yet when you think about it, we're so disconnected with one another. It's one thing to send an email to somebody or tweet or whatever you want to call it. It's another thing to look them in the eye, to listen carefully, to understand the emotion and the engagement that takes place on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I had the wonderful experience in growing up and seeing that happen. I saw it happen individually in a family and I saw it publicly. And as I said, there was really no separation. Well, I better stop right now or we will get into the real Humphrey tradition, which is a speech that doesn't end. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me be here. I just have to say, as somebody who heard a lot of Humphrey speeches, both from your father and from you, ne we never mind. It's, it's always great. Thank you, Skip. We're now going to hear from Albert Isley. Al, Al is the editor-at-large of The Hill, a nonpartisan newspaper covering Congress and politics which he helped start in 1994. He was nominated three times for Pulitzer Prize before stepping down as editor in 2005. Since then, he's made reporting trips to Iraq twice, as well as to places like Kazakhstan, Cuba, Germany, France, Japan. Al's journalism career also included a stint as Washington correspondent for the St. Paul Dispatch and Pioneer Press. That's where I remember seeing the bylines first. Knight Ritter newspapers. He was press secretary to Vice President Walter Mondale. He is an author of an acclaimed dual biography of Eugene McCarthy and Hubert Humphrey, which he's currently now revising and updating for republication in 2011, so watch for that. Please help me welcome Al Isley back to Minnesota. Thank you, Kathy, for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, certainly better than the one I got when I spoke in Denver recently, and they in introduced me with these words, and now here's the latest dope from Washington. Uh, <laughs> as, as I listened to Skip Humphrey, I almost thought I was listening to his father, and if it hadn't been for the fact that he, uh, sorry? It hadn't been for the fact that he, that he stopped quickly, I would have believed it was him. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Kathy and Bob Meek, and all your colleagues for your wonderful work and, and leadership in organizing this well-deserved tribute to Minnesota's most famous political figure. As I looked over the familiar names of the many founding sponsors and honorary co-chairs and host committee members and other speakers and panelists and moderators, I'm reminded of what President Kennedy said when he hosted a White House dinner in 1962 for the U.S. Nobel, American Nobel Peace Prize winners, which I will paraphrase as follows. He said, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent, of human knowledge that's ever been gathered together in one place, with the possible exception of when Hubert Humphrey dined with his Minnesota friends. Uh, <laughs> Let me begin by saying <clears throat> that I'm honored to be here, to be invited to participate in this celebration of the centennial of Hubert Humphrey's birth. I can't help but notice that another great Minnesotan is, was being honored last night at Twin Stadium, Harmon Killebrew. Um, and um, he, in many ways, he was, he was a lot like Humphrey in that he exemplified the spirit of, of compassion and, uh, and all the qualities that, 
that uh, Hubert Humphrey demonstrated. I must say I was disappointed to be told that I only have, I have to limit my remarks to about 15 minutes as I learned while covering Humphrey's speeches through the years that was only enough time to clear your throat. Uh, <clears throat> as they used to say in Minnesota, what comes after a Humphrey speech on Saturday night? The answer is Sunday morning. Yeah. <laughs> However, I will, I will try to stay within my time limit here. As Henry VIII said to each of his wives, I will not be keeping you long. Uh, <clears throat> besides, it would take a lot longer than a typical Humphrey speech to pay justice to, uh, to the many, uh, to one of the most remarkable politicians we've seen to appear on the American landscape. I want to relate a personal experience yesterday. I flew out of Reagan National Airport and I was, uh, I was signed to seat uh, 21A and I wasn't paying attention. I sat in 22A and a, a flight was packed and a lady came and said, I'm sorry, you're sitting in my seat. And I looked at my ticket and I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in the one ahead of you. She said, that's all right, I'll sit there. And so a lady sitting next to me, a few minutes later, a very good-looking young man came up and said, excuse me, my wife and two daughters are sitting across from, me, from you. Could you mind exchanging seats with me? So she did. And then he promptly pulled out a copy of, of the newspaper Politico, which is a competitor of the Hill, and started reading it. And as I always do when I see somebody reading the competition, I said, what do you think of that paper? He said, well, it's very good. They do a terrific job of covering Washington. He said, it's better than some of those other papers like the Hill. <laughs> and, and, and I said, you know, you shouldn't have said that because I helped start the Hill. And then um, uh, I said, what do you, uh, we, we were talking. and. He said, why are you going out to Minnesota? And I said, well, I'm going to go to speak at the 100th anniversary of Humphrey's birth. And he said, Hubert Humphrey was my grandfather. And I said, what's your name? He said, Bucky Humphrey. Buck, Buck Humphrey. And so, we, <laughs> so talk, talk about serendipity. Uh, he told we we chatted all the way out and had a very nice conversation. He told me a great story about his grandfather campaigning down in near my in my part of the state down near the Iowa border in one of those small towns. And he said Humphrey went up to a group of older people and said, "I'm Hubert Humphrey. You'll vote for me." And they said, "Well, no, I'm sorry, we were not going to." And he went to another group and he said the same thing. And they said, "Will you vote for me?" He said, "No, we're not going to vote for you." And he went to a third group and he got the same answer. And finally he said, "Can I ask why it is you're not going to vote for me?" He said, because, Senator, you're in Iowa. <laughs> see, see, uh, uh, I, I want to I address an issue raised by John Stewart, who is one of Humphrey's top aides, uh, which Jenny Sherman passed on to me. He, he wondered why Senator, last week when the Senate passed a resolution uh, acknowledging Humphrey's 100th anniversary, uh, birth of his anniversary, wondered why Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama had uh, had objected to some language in the resolution. The, um, and the Sessions moved to strike the last five lines of the resolution which expressed, quote, the importance of a vibrant and responsive public sector as illustrated by the numerous legislative achievements of Hubert H. Humphrey and his lifetime of service to all the people of the United States and the people around the world. Um, John Stewart said he couldn't understand. He said, I'm more or less speechless over the incredible pettiness of Senator Sessions, who it is fair to say has never laid eyes on Hubert Humphrey and to my mind is not qualified to sharpen in his pencils. Well, uh, on Wednesday, I went up, I caught Senator Sessions as he was coming off the Senate floor, and I said, I'm going out to Minnesota to speak at the Humphrey, Humphrey's uh, anniversary of his birth, and I said, I'm sure people are going to ask me why you objected to that part of the resolution. And he was kind of semi-apologetic, and he said, well, I, I, I did it because of a senator who was going to be absent uh, asked me to do it. He said, I, I generally agree with uh, him because I'm uh, opposed to wasteful federal public sp uh, sector spending. Uh, but he wouldn't tell me who it was. So being a crack investigative reporter, I decided to find out, try to find out. So uh, because this resolution was passed by unanimous consent, there was no roll call vote. Uh, so I couldn't find out who the four absent senators was. But earlier in the day, there was a big vote on a federal judicial appointment that the Republicans opposed, and they were trying to get cl uh, cloture so they could shut off uh, debate and vote on it, uh, but they failed to do that. Anyway, I checked there in the roll call vote, and uh, there were four senators who were absent. Now, three of them are Republicans. One was Senator, the Democrat was Max Baucus of Montana, who incidentally is one of the half, uh, half dozen 
current senators who were in the Senate when Humphrey left there, and I knew it wasn't him. And then the two other, two of the other senators, uh, Kay Bailey Hutchinson from Texas and Jerry Moran from Kansas, I made some discreet inquiries and determined it was not them. Now, if you promise not to tell anybody, I will tell you who it was. It was Senator David Vitter of Louisiana. Uh, now, you shouldn't feel too badly because Senator Vitter is not exactly one of the giants of the Senate. In fact, he is also not one of the paragons of virtue, having been forced to publicly apologize in 2007 for his name having turned up on a list of uh, Washington call girl operation. Uh, anyway, I wouldn't want you to hold that against the great state of Louisiana because, ironically, that's where Humphrey got his master's degree at Louisiana State University. And even more ironic, Humphrey was elected to the Senate with Russ, the same year as Russell Long in 1948, and uh, he was a fellow student at LSU. In fact, when Humphrey made his final appearance on the Senate floor a month before he died, very emotional thing, all the senators were there and gave him a long standing ovation. The first senator to come up and give him a big bear hug was Russell Long. Um, as Skip Humphrey said, this is about looking to the future, and I don't want to look too much to the past, but I think it's hard to believe that Humphrey having been gone for 33 years and even harder to believe he could be he would be pleased with the current state of American politics especially with those members of Congress along with the former governor of Minnesota and other Republican presidential hopefuls who are trying to do uh, to dismantle many of the programs and policies he fought for. If he went back to the Senate today, I think he would quickly remind them of the words that summed up his political philosophy. He said that the moral test of government is how the, that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, sick the needy, and the handicapped. Uh, I should note quickly that I left Minnesota 45 years ago to go to Washington as a correspondent for the St. Paul and Duluth and other night Ritter News newspapers. Uh, I left journalism in 1977 when Senator Mondale, who had uh, just been elected vice president, asked me to go to work for him as his press secretary. I'd covered Mondale ever since he came to the Senate. We, we came to Washington at the same time. And they asked him, I, I had written many stories about him, and I, as every politician I covered, I tried to give them credit when they deserve it and give them hell when they deserve it. And they asked him, I'd written some critical stories, and they asked him, why did you hire Isley as your press secretary he said I wanted to get him out of journalism <laughs> uh, but it was a great it was a great experience and my only regret as I was not able to help him shorten his title um, after he and President Carter left office in 1981 I forget who it was that uh, caused that to happen but um, uh, <laughs> I had a number of jobs before I returned to journalism in 1994 to help start the hill I know it's not nice Minnesota to, Minnesota nice to brag but I think it's safe to say that I have witnessed more Minnesota history from the perspective of the nation's capital than anybody else whether I have done that better than anybody else is open to debate but I know of no other person who can claim to have interviewed and written about such legendary Minnesotans as Harold Stassen, Joe Ball, John Zwack, Jesse Ventura, and Michelle Bachman. As was noted, I also wrote a dual biography of Hubert Humphrey and Eugene McCarthy, which I'm revising, updating and revising, hope to bring out under a new title later this year. Uh, I've been asked why I'm doing this so many years after they've passed in the scene, and I said, I, because I have to keep doing it till I get it right. Uh, <laughs> there are many people here today, Norm Sherman and others, who, who, and DJ Leary, who worked with Humphrey and through the years and knew him much better than I did. And I look forward to, and I'm sure you do, to hearing from them, but I know they will all agree with me that he was without a doubt one of the most important figures in American politics in the last half of the 20th century. Our purpose today is to bring to life Humphrey's legacy of compassion and optimism and decency and patriotism and faith in the future of this great country. Uh, I was once asked to sum him up in a single phrase and after thinking long and hard I said there was no darkness in Humphrey, he was a man full of light and hope and optimism. Maybe even a better way to sum him up is the inscription on his tombstone out at Lakewood Cemetery. He said, I have enjoyed my life, its disappointments outreached by its pleasures. I have loved my country in a way that some people consider sentimental and out of style. I still do and I remain an optimist with joy without apology about this country and about the American experience.
experiment in democracy. Uh, I think it is equally important as we celebrate his life and legacy, we also celebrate the unique politic, political system of Minnesota, which he and so many, many others in this room had a lot to do with helping create, both Republicans and Democrats. Eight years ago, I wrote an article for a Twin, a Twin Cities magazine called The Rake, which is, I hope is not one of the reasons why it is no longer in business, but <laughs> I described what I called the Minnesota model. And please forgive me for quoting from one of my favorite authors, but I said, the hallmark of the Minnesota model is an essential decency and pragmatic common sense, coupled with the rejection of corruption and bossism, a distaste for extremist factions, a belief in education is the key to economic opportunity and social stability, a willingness to engage with the rest of the world, and a deep-seated conviction that government exists to improve the lives of all Americans. I think that is true, and still true, even in the current unhealthy political environment in Washington and around the country, which is as toxic and unproductive as I can remember. Uh, the point is that all of these qualities, I think, were exemplified in the Minnesota model, were personified by Hubert Humphrey. Um, I am going to, um, uh, in, in view of the time element here, I think we're running a little behind, but I, I do want to say that uh, that uh, I think Humphrey's, as the Senate resolution last week stated, Humphrey had many historic accomplishments. Quote, Hubert Humphrey compiled a record of accomplishment virtually unmatched in the 20th century, encompassing, among other issues, civil and human rights, workforce development, labor rights, health care, arms control, and disarmament, the Peace Corps, small business assistance, education reform, wilderness preservation, immigration reform, and agriculture. But he, he himself, I think, rightly felt that his key role in the 1964 civil rights, passing the civil rights bill was his greatest single accomplishment. Uh, uh, let, me, uh, let me end here by saying that, uh, that uh, uh, quoting the words of two people who knew Humphrey very well, and one of them will surprise you, it was Senator Barry Goldwater. Uh, in his 1988 autobiography, Goldwater reminisced about what he calls some of the giant leaders of the Senate. He said, Hubert Humphrey was among the greatest. I don't think I disagreed politically with any man more in my life, but Humphrey was a fair fighter, one of the most honorable men I ever met. The Minnesotan was not a show horse, as some suggested. Hubert did his homework, worked hard in the legislative process, and never gave an inch if he believed he was right. He had a terrific sense of humor, <clears throat> and of course, was an outstanding speaker for 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, Humphrey's weakness was the two-hour barn burner. The other person you'll hear from later today was Vice President, is Vice President Walter Mondale. As he said in his memorable eulogy at Humphrey's funeral, which I have to point out, both Norm Sherman and I helped him write, he said, Hubert Humphrey taught us all how to hope and how to love. He taught us how to win and how to lose. He taught us how to live, and finally, he taught us how to die. Thank you for your attention and for including me in this special day, and I look forward to sharing it with you.